Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Fendrick. I'm a professor of medicine and public health at the University of Michigan, where I direct the Center for Value-Based Insurance Design. I'm uh, thrilled to be here. I want to thank Mary Beth and her team. I've worked with BMA almost since its inception. And uh, it's really fortunate for us to follow Dr. Fowler in terms of, I think he set the stage, she set the stage extraordinarily well for our discussion around value-based care broadly, the innovations that are occurring at our fabulous panelist organizations, and the, the world of, of value-based insurance design. Before I introduce our panelists, I just figured for those of you who had not heard of VBID or don't know about value-based insurance design, a little bit of context that, um, and Liz touched upon this a fair bit, as a practicing primary care clinician, I don't think there's no better time uh, to be in the world of either preventive medicine or, or the management of chronic diseases. It's so unbelievably exciting from the clinical standpoint. But if you come to meetings like this, and those of you who attend a lot of different meetings around healthcare transformation, you'll see that a majority of the conversation tends to be on the cost of care and how we pay for care as opposed to the health metrics that are so important and the ones that Liz raised. And since there are some people who are following the famous BMA Twitter hashtag, uh, I like to tell people that I did not go to medical school to learn how to save people money. Although uh, I have come to realize that uh, understanding fiscal responsibility is really important, uh, which is some of the issues that we're going to talk about today. So, what the good news is, whether you be a Republican or Democrat or management or labor or provider or a payer, is that just about everyone agrees in the US there's enough money in the system. That we don't need to ask for 22% of GDP or 25% of GDP. And that I think the issue that I've been focusing on, sad to say for over three decades, is how to spend our money better and to change the conversation from how much we spend to how well we spend. And it's not only about, as we heard about, affordability and access, but to hear the emphasis of this current administration and many BMA members, as well as the organizations here, their focus on equity and the idea of uh, making it easier uh, for patients to get the care they need, but also pay attention to the care that's being paid for by all of us that's not making Americans any healthier. So that's pretty much the, uh, the context in, in which we are. When it comes to uh, patient-facing models, and, and Dr. Fowler said value-based insurance design is one of the few models that actually impact patients as opposed to the almost a tremendous majority of the models, not just in the federal government, but going around the country that are focused on payment. It's really important to remember my most tweetable soundbite is that Americans do not care about healthcare costs. They care about what it costs them. And that's why Medicare Advantage, with its premium advantages and out-of-pocket cost reductions and supplemental benefits, have really aligned uh, with value-based insurance design. And for those of you who don't know, um, value-based insurance design principles at its core are only allowed to be implemented in Medicare Advantage plans, while we wait and hope for VBID principles to be incorporated in traditional Medicare. Uh, this has allowed uh, my friendship and collaboration uh, with the Better Medicare Alliance uh, to grow. So to think about the days that uh, Mary Beth and Greg Greer know that begging for plans to think about transportation and nutrition and benefits that are not viewed to be traditional uh, now becoming more and more the norm as Dr. Fowler talked about is extraordinarily important and particularly a focus on underserved populations and the most frail among us which uh, will be discussed uh, by our panelists today. To think that when I first came uh, two administrations ago to think that we should allow value-based insurance design principles in Medicare and the MAVBID model test as Dr. Fowler mentioned was launched in 2017 with seven plans in seven states in seven conditions and now it's not quite ubiquitous but the growth that she talked about is very encouraging that not only specific to value-based insurance design but more broadly uh, to value-based care, which we'll discuss, I think will be very important. So with that context, uh, we'll go on, on mute, probably happily for most of you, and uh, turn the remainder of this hour, for the most part, over to our panelists. I'm just going to give their names and their organizations. You could find their excellent 
uh, biographies in your uh, online materials that BMA provided. And we're just gonna go in the order across the room uh, I, like you did with Dr. Fowler, if you have some specific questions that you'd like to ask all of us or some of us, please write them down on the card, and I hope I could let Jonathan get some extra steps on his step counter to pick them up throughout the hour. We're going to start with uh, Stephen Green from Chen Med, followed by Kyle Wales at Wellvana. Uh, next will be Dr. Amy Flaster from Concerto Care, and uh, David Rosales of VNS Health uh, will wrap that up. And... Uh, if it's okay with everyone, we'll start with Stephen, please. Well, thank you, Mark. It's uh, really terrific to be here. I appreciate uh, BMA setting this up and including us. Um, just for starters, uh, to explain who and what ChenMed is, um, and I'm, I'm going first because Mark said that in some ways we're maybe the most traditional, but uh, we consider ourselves quite transformational and, and disruptive. Um, we're a senior-focused company that really takes care of the frail and vulnerable seniors. We do it through Medicare Advantage because of the flexibilities it offers. So, so we operate only in, in global full-risk arrangements. And what we've done is built a family company from South Florida that's been doing this way back when Mary Beth and Liz said, you know, it's called Medicare Plus Choice, um, into uh, essentially a, a chain of clinics across 15 states, more than 100 locations, all doing the same thing. We've learned what it means to take responsibility for somebody's health. We've learned long ago what kinds of things you need to do that are, that are beyond the clinical, but before the buzzwords of social determinants of health and, and DBID and that sort of thing. And so we've created a model where we, where we honor seniors with affordable VIP care that delivers better health. We do that by uh, really focusing on these complex patients. They have, they have doctors who only take care of about 400 patients because of how complex the patients are. They support all of the coordination of the MA benefits, the transportation or the food benefits. We, we ensure easy access to care with on-site dispensing of medications. <clears throat> we have staff that coordinates their specialty care and uh, transitional care and all of those sorts of things. And so, um, this time, talking about this issue that we're going into AEP, that the election period, I think is a, is a really interesting time because what I'll look forward to talking about in the panel is, is the opportunity for physicians, especially in accountable relationships, to play a bigger role in helping patients understand uh, what kinds of benefits are best suited for their clinical and social needs and how that ultimately uh, can get them to better health that, that we all want, that's gonna create that win-win of better costs, not that Mark went to medical school for that, but also the better outcomes and the better experience for everybody involved. So um, I'm happy as we go through it to uh, shed a little bit more light on, on the ChenMed model, but to keep it brief and make sure we have a lot of conversation, I will leave it there for introductions. Awesome, thank you. So Kyle Wales, uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Walvana Health. At Walvana, we're a value-based care enablement platform. Um, so as you think about our model, we're helping primary care providers move into value-based care reimbursement. We also do that generally through fully capitated models. So in those models, we'll hold the, hold the payer contract, typically directly with the Medicare Advantage plan or in some of the newer Medicare models as well, be it direct contracting for this year or ACO reach in, in 2023. I think there's a few unique nuances of our model in comparison to the industry today. The first is really, we have a very flexible physician alignment strategy. And what I mean by that is, as you look at the, the broader you know, healthcare universe today, uh, I actually read a stat on the way here, uh, the, the overall medical spend from a pure Medicare perspective is increasing by $200 million a day right now. And so as we think about just the sheer size of that uh, market that we're trying to have a significant impact on from a quality and cost perspective, our belief is you have to have a flexible alignment strategy with providers. And so we have a, an ownership model where we own practices and employ providers directly. We partner with large groups through joint ventures, typically 100 plus provider uh, type physician groups. And then we also partner through an affiliate model uh, with smaller physician practices, about four to five providers on average. And because you know, the healthcare is so local, every practice is gonna be different. We use those models in different ways to truly try and have an impact on the outcome and the cost of the system. Once we build uh, the primary, ca uh, primary care network and the markets that we go into, we then wrap that with a specialty network, right? And so think about that as uh, truly a narrow network in the traditional HMO sense, 
uh, we'll have one you know, acute care facility or try to have one acute care facility in a given market at a discounted rate. Uh, we'll have one ortho, you know, pulmonologist, cardiology, et cetera, and, and really try and get as much care as we possibly can driven through uh, that specialty network. We overlay both of those with a proprietary technology platform. What that does is really allow us to identify uh, interventions for the right patients at the right time based on a variety of disparate data systems that we have. But I would say more importantly, you know, because the day-to-day the -day workflow in a traditional fee-for-service environment for providers uh, is so crazy, right? They're seeing probably 25 patients a day, if not more. Uh, we try and take as much work as we possibly can off the provider. So we do a lot of work around risk adjustment or care management or care coordination. And that's driving to a lot of the success that, that uh, you can see here. We're in about 20 states today. Uh, our biggest states are, are Texas, Arizona, and Tennessee. You know, approximately 85,000 uh, patients for next year, of which approximately 75,000 of those are under fully capitated payment models with either Medicare Advantage or Medicare. From a, a physician perspective, uh, we deploy our technology. We don't make the providers uh, switch their EMR. Uh, we have a ribbon that sits on top of the EMR, and it's effectively doing a screen scrape of the name and, and date of birth. Uh, with that, we can take all the data we have, so claims information, lab, pharmacy, clinical data, uh, and push to the provider at the point of care key things that are gonna be critical for them. So it could be uh, suspect conditions that they should be watching for based on the data that is predicting what they might have. It could be gaps in care, right, around a colonoscopy or a mammogram, a lot of quality focus initiatives that we have around that, but also tools uh, like discharge notifications. So we'll have uh, hospital alerts that come into our system every 10 minutes, and we're pushing that back to the provider so they know where their patients are uh, across the ecosystem of healthcare uh, versus traditionally what, what they would know is just really what they see within their practice directly. You know, what do we get from that? It's really the ability to impact what we call sort of low value care. And so using an example from our data, about a billion dollars in, in medical spend uh, under management today, there's about 60-ish percent of that spend that's across the top 10% of patients. And so these are gonna be uh, you know, many comorbidities, polychronic, you know, patients, COPD, CHF, CKD, diabetes, as, as a few examples of what we're typically seeing. And almost 350 million of that 600 million uh, is from spend that's across inpatient or post-acute or emergency room. And our belief is we can have a massive impact by getting that care into the right clinical setting, be it a, a specialty environment that's not necessarily in an acute environment. Uh, it could be an ASC, it could be home-based, and our team is doing a lot of that work. So it starts with the data and analytics to identify those patients. Our care coordinators are helping schedule uh, wellness appointments for patients or they're helping close gaps in care. Uh, our care managers, which are, are certified RNs, uh, are engaging with the high needs population every single week. Uh, and the intent of that is to help identify the right care setting for the patient, uh, keep them out of the hospital where clinically appropriate, uh, and ultimately, ultimately back in their home. And I think the ultimate end goal, really for, for any disruptive business, and I think what all of our companies are, are doing are, are very disruptive within healthcare, it's about how do you improve access, uh, make it more convenient, and make it more cost effective or affordable. That's applicable across any industry. It's certainly applicable within healthcare. You know, the nurse case managers make care more accessible for, for our team, right? We can treat a lot of things remotely rather than having to wait you know, many months to get into your primary care provider. It's more convenient. Our, our teams help patients navigate care through referral management and other programs, and certainly more cost effective from the shared savings that we're providing. So that's Wavana and uh, the impact that we're, we're trying to have. So happy to be here, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is always the moment of truth. <laughs> Just waiting for some slides. See, the problem is they're Giants fans, not Eagles fans back there. <laughs> so they're just pulling us away here. I'll give it a minute. And if, if we don't have slides, I can just speak off the cuff. Concerto care, please. I think while we're waiting for slides, I'll take a minute just to introduce myself and um, our organization. There we go.
Awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, it's great to meet all of you. My name is Amy Flaster. I'm a primary care doc um, in practice and the chief medical officer at Concerto Care. Uh, before I start, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Uh, it's great to be with a group of very like-minded people. Uh, there are a lot of commonalities, I think, in what we're all doing, and uh, it's wonderful to see us collectively trying to build organizations that would deliver the kind of care that we would all want for our family members and, and our loved ones. Um, with that said, I'll spend a couple minutes introducing those of you that don't know to Concerto Care and what it is we're trying to do. Concerto Care is a company that aims to deliver care in the home and virtually to aging, complex, and vulnerable patients. Uh, and as I'll get into, we really try and, and deliver that care differently in a way that uh, is patient-centered and allows our patients to age with dignity and in place. Um, so I'll begin with the problem that I think is well known to everyone in this room, which is that our healthcare system frequently fails seniors, especially those that have complex care needs, that have vulnerabilities, that may have a difficult time leaving their homes. And so we've named ourselves Concerto Care because we aim to be the concerto, be the orchestra that wraps around our patients. Uh, we often say that a concerto is a conversation between a soloist and an orchestra. And we think of the patient and their family and their caregivers as being wrapped around and surrounded by our services and our care model. We know that nine out of 10 adults would prefer to receive long-term care in their home as they age. That is the norm for the vast majority of people. And so we go to great lengths as a delivery organization to make that possible, to support uh, our patients in preserving their independence, in receiving very specific geriatric care in their homes. Uh, and we have a team, as I'll get into, of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, health coaches, behavioral health supports, and social workers that all act to surround that patient and their family. I'll spend a minute going through these six pillars that are the core of what we do. Uh, I mentioned already we have a comprehensive multidisciplinary team in every market in which we operate. So within those markets, we have palliative care docs, complex internists, geriatricians, nurse practitioners, but also pharmacists, community health workers, uh, geriatric psychiatrists, social workers. So a really robust group of people that are within uh, the team and can support our patients. A second core element of our model is geriatric clinical reasoning. And I'll share that I'm an internal medicine doc. I'm not a geriatrician, nor is our CEO. And we often say that geriatrics is a specialty. It is a fellowship for a reason. There are specific things one can do to provide really good care to people as they enter the later years of their lives. And so we center all elements of our care model, our care pathway, and the way we train our clinicians on geriatric principles. Uh, we have an intensive in-home model. So we aim to get into the home of every patient that we see. And for anyone who's had care in the home, and I have as both a daughter and a mother, uh, it's a really special relationship you develop with that provider. They're in your space, they see how you live, we can see our patients' pillboxes. If they allow us, we can look in the fridge. So we really get a sense of who our patients are and what they need. Social determinants of health, as we'll talk about more, is a core element of our model, and we aim to identify them and support them. And then technology. Uh, we use remote patient monitoring uh, to keep eyes and ears on our patients when we're not in the home. And we have a platform, as many others do. Ours is called P3D, and that is our proprietary population health platform that allows us to get our hands on as much data as we possibly can to get to know our patients and stratify them. And so with that core model, as I'll get into, we deliver that in three channels, all again targeted at uh, complex and vulnerable aging populations. The first is what we call our care partners model. That's a wraparound model where we support a patient and their existing primary care doc to supply and provide all of these services. And we do that working with health plans, so working with Medicare Advantage plans. The second model is geriatric primary care, where we are the PCP of record. So we take over all elements of that patient's primary care for the duration of their life. 
Uh, we do that both working with Medicare Advantage plans and also in uh, the direct contracting, soon to be ACO REACH model. And lastly, we're engaged in PACE, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with and is uh, primarily for those 55 and older nursing home eligible duels. Uh, briefly, just to show some of the outcomes that we uh, are really proud to share, this is comparing both the care partners model and the geriatric primary care model, uh, and is looking uh, at a difference in differences analysis. So for those that are into outcomes and into health services research, we're certainly aware of regression to the mean, and so we hold ourselves to a standard comparing ourselves to a uh, risk-adjusted comparison group. Uh, and even accounting for regression to the mean, we see significant reductions for our patients and how often they go to the hospital, how often they go to the emergency room, how often they're readmitted. Uh, so we know that this care that we're providing is, is having a difference. Uh, I'll skip over this, I mentioned it already, but just to clarify the different reimbursement structures in which we operate, um, working closely with Medicare Advantage and, and many of you in the room. Uh, we serve patients coast to coast and we're growing. Um, I'm based in Boston and we are in the Massachusetts market. Uh, we're in New York and, and have quite a coastal presence, aiming to, to increase our presence in the coming years in the middle of the country. Uh, this is our leadership team. Um, these are my closest colleagues and friends, but I flash this on the screen just to show the breadth of uh, expertise that we bring. Our CEO, Dr. Julian Harris, is probably familiar to many of you. He has a background in policy and is very committed to this space. Our COO comes from Oak Street Health. Our CFO comes from Kaiser Permanente and Cigna. So a group of people that have really dedicated their lives to really promoting value-based care and moving that agenda forward. I think I'm gonna skip over this just um, in the, for the sake of time. So looking forward to taking any questions and um, thank you again. Thanks, Amy. Good action. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm David Rosales, Chief Strategy Officer at VNS Health and uh, Happy to be here and to round out this panel of, uh, Amy, I agree, very like-minded um, uh, uh, organizations. Uh, I'm gonna focus a little bit more narrowly on value-based insurance design in the context of Medicare Advantage, but really focused on the last 12 to 18 months of life. Um, and because that's, that's um, an area that we have, where we have been participating as, a, as an integrated payer and provider in, in improving the experience of, of Medicare beneficiaries at the end of life, um, improving quality and um, improving affordability. Um, VNS Health, just a quick thumbnail on us. We're based in New York City. Up until earlier this year, we were known as the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, or VNSNY. We rebranded to VNS Health really to reflect uh, the breadth of services that we provide. We are the largest home care and hospice provider in New York. Um, and we also operate uh, several health plans, including Medicare Advantage plans, but really focused on complex high needs populations, uh, similar to the population served by my co-panelists here, uh, primarily dually eligible individuals, most of whom have long-term care needs. And what that means is we have had a front row seat to uh, the significant pain points that exist uh, uh, in the typical trajectory of a Medicare Advantage beneficiary in the last 12 to 18 months of life. Um, so we're all familiar with uh, some of these pain points, um, you, you know, the uh, avoidable utilization, the sort of revolving door in and out of the hospital, um, the lack of access to hospice or timely access um, to hospice, the lack of access to palliative care um, that can really meet someone where they are to, uh, to to um, uh, address their care planning needs and their symptom management. And even for those that do, um, are, are able to access hospice, that do transition to hospice, um, what we have in the Med Medicare Advantage system is a bifurcation, right? The hospice benefit today is carved out of Medicare Advantage and it creates, it can create a further fragmentation um, in, that, in that member experience. So, uh, a couple years ago, CMMI 
carved out a, a separate track of the value-based insurance design demonstration for MA plans focused on hospice and the hospice benefit component. And um, what this demonstration is testing is more than just a, a transfer of payment for hospice from traditional fee-for-service to uh, Medicare Advantage. It's, it's taking a holistic approach um, to how we can improve that end-of-life care experience uh, through access to palliative care, through access to transitional concurrent care, allowing more of a gentle bridge between um, curative care um, and hospice, among other innovations. And we've been participating since the first year of the demonstration. So we've, uh, we've, we've, we've tried to take an innovative approach to, um, and holistic approach to uh, uh, taking advantage of this demonstration to improve the experience at the end of life. Um, uh, we've taken a data-based approach, uh, um, developing analytic models that predict um, which members are at higher risk of mortalities within 12 to 18 months. We then proactively outreach those members and engage them often in their homes um, and meet them where they are uh, to initiate the process of, of symptom management and to start those conversations about goals of care several months, in, several months before hospice is even raised. We also take a very hospice-friendly approach to how we incorporate the hospice benefit as a health plan, right? We, 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 we are, we are look, we're looking not to approach this in a traditional managed care model, but really embracing the hospice care model and trying to drive more hospice utilization um, earlier and sooner. So far, we've, we've seen some very promising uh, uh, results and impact. We've seen increases in the, in the, in the barometers you'd want to see, increases in, uh, in members who access palliative care, increases in the number of members who, when they pass away, pass away on hospice, increase in the length of time our members are on hospice, and then decreases in avoidable inpatient and emergency use, room use, and, uh, and you know, one barometer we look at uh, holistically is, is the impact on the total cost of care in the last 12 months of life, and that's where we've seen a significant decrease as well. Uh, we're, we're very passionate about uh, the opportunity that this demonstration creates. We're actually uh, so passionate that we are uh, looking to support other health plans to participate in this model. Right now, about 15 plans participate uh, in about half of the states across the country, and, uh, and we are excited about uh, the opportunity this innovation uh, provides to really improve um, uh, both cost, quality, uh, and, uh, and the member experience uh, in uh, what, is a dip what is now a very difficult uh, trend, you know, period in someone's life. Thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you all. I have to say, Mary Beth and Greg, you know, one of the reasons why I decided for this to be my first in-person meeting in 30 months is that I would be inspired by the panelists in this meeting at large and you guys have all kind of overachieved in that regard. Now, I spent a lot of time talking to the media about why two-thirds of Americans think that American healthcare is broken and it's hearing about transformative and courageous folks like you who are gonna try to make the system better for patients. And um, you heard Mary Beth and, and Dr. Fowler talk about alignment. And um, Dr. Fowler might remember, and David, you know, when I first went to Capitol Hill in 2007, pushing for hospice benefits, that put me squarely in the death panelist category. So <laughs> welcome to the club. Um, but I, I'm also known, uh, as we're not quite near at lunch, as the peanut butter and jelly person, and I'll tell you why. Um, I view payment reform and how you deal with clinicians like Amy and myself as uh, the supply side issue as peanut butter. And the area where I focus, the demand side or consumer facing issue as jelly. And I worked for years with my students to come up with the best idea of the sum being greater than the individual parts. And they came up after lock and key and violin and bow, they came up with peanut butter and jelly and the fact that when you put the two together, uh, it always makes for a better product. There might be one person out there who doesn't like jelly, sorry, but most people like peanut butter and jelly and neither one of them. So uh, we touch on, um, and, and CMMI is guilty of this, they have payment models, like most of them, and, and you heard they have few patient-centered models like VBID, 
But what I think you're all kind of getting at is your models actually think about both the peanut butter and the jelly. And uh, I want it to be easy, not hard for patients, particularly the most vulnerable patients, to get the evidence-based care they need from the provider that does it best in the location that is most efficient at the time that is right. So Stephen, I know Chen, that has been a core of what you folks are doing, but I'd like all of you to kind of talk about how you might be dealing with this alignment issue and, and how you all uh, are specifically trying to, in the case of Wolvana, making it easier for clinicians, but what are you doing for patients? And in the case of what you're doing, David, maybe the other way around. But if we can move down the panel again uh, to respond to that and whatever other issues that might have arisen from the previous panelists, uh, that'd be fine. Yeah, um, making me hungry, but uh, the peanut butter and jelly uh, metaphor make, makes a lot of sense. You know, as I said, ChenMed's been doing this for a long time. We do it mostly for these frail, vulnerable seniors. About 40% of them are dual uh, enrolled. Um, actually, probably are more dual eligible. Sometimes it's hard for people to figure out they're actually Medicaid eligible. Um, and, and what we've been trying to do is say, how do we make it easier for them to take care of themselves? So fundamentally, we're in the behavior change business, right? I need you to show up for a visit. I need you to take this medicine. I need you to eat this kind of food. I need you to do this kind of exercise. It's all behavior change. And so the, the idea of the peanut butter and jelly uh, makes a lot of sense to me because we're trying to say, here's why it's good for you. But if there's another way to say, here's why it's easy for you, or here's something in it for you, um, th then that makes our job easier. So, so we've been able to take without some of those features, um, our patient demographics, which look you know, demonstrably more complex and sick than the average Medicare beneficiary, and um, have them end up going to the hospital and the emergency room about 30 to 50% less often than an average non-complex uh, patient. And um, most of the efforts uh, to support that are just brute force in relationship, patient doctor, patient care team relationship. And then you started to see a lot of this um, uh, sort of, I'll call it non-surgical, just this kind of uh, one size fits all thing. You see it really terribly in, in the commercial segment. I'll just make them change their behaviors by giving them a $5,000 deductible or something like that. Um, and in Medicare, we now see things like C-SNPs and D-SNPs and the VBID program. And um, the, the, the beauty of that is it allows for the right people to get the right um, services. The challenge that we see is it's actually getting kind of overwhelming. So if I, I have to go shop for my mother-in-law's uh, Medicare uh, Advantage plan this, in the next couple months here, uh, Palm Beach County, there's like 45 plans that are all $0 copay, $0 premium, like how am I gonna choose? And I'm pretty educated about how healthcare works. So, we're talking about people that may have health literacy challenges, people that may have um, uh, a combination of, of social factors. They may not even have access to, to um, uh, Medicare plan finder. And then they've got brokers calling them and they've got Joe Namath telling them stuff on TV and they've got all of these things coming at them. And so we're really starting to lean into the idea that it is our job to help them understand what benefits are out there and what fits their social and, and clinical needs some people really do need uh, benefits that are more designed for solving the transportation issues or the food insecurity issues or the housing insecurity issues or end of life planning because we know where they are in that. And so um, what we wanna do is really start to make it easier for folks, but that's not easy because it's all still held at this plan level and there's so many choices, even our, even our doctors who only care for 400 patients, where are they gonna sort of navigate through, through this? Um, so I think the opportunities there um, and, uh, you know, we very much want to take advantage of it, but, but would love to figure out how to make it easier for, for providers and patients alike to understand what's there and how it may, may right. benefit them and who qualifies, when they qualify. So there's that saying, you know, make the right thing easy to do and the wrong thing hard to do. And so I think there's, there's room to, to take on that. So Kyle, before you go, I just, so I, I couldn't see Amy's body language to think, what they would ask of me during my 11 minute visit where I need 40 minutes that you're asking me, Stephen, to add on an element to the unbelievably complicated thing that me as a clinician really knows 
very little about right. plan choice in That's general. Right. To get into that, so hold and on to that. Yeah, well, you'll can, get I, to that, can I give a 15 seconds? 15 seconds, we, but was, was we, Amy, she, we couldn't see if she was smiling or I'm frowning. I don't know. But I bet she was frowning. I'm, just, I'm sure she's pulling know. her hair out. Right, well, whatever, I have no hair to pull we, out. So anyway, well, We've whatever. just started creating a thing where we have a, a, a clinical committee to look by county at plans to help doctors, just like hospitals help. That, that's better so, than anyway. during the office, I, I, I get it. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you're, you're up. No, I think it's a, it's a critical, uh, topic of conversation, and, and to your point, I'll focus more on it from a, a patient perspective versus a Please. provider perspective. Um, as you, you know, as you go into a patient, you're trying to select which plan you go to. Clearly, from a marketing perspective, you're getting hit from a thousand different angles. The regulatory rules around what we can do on behalf of providers, and also what the providers can do, I would say, are probably even more complex, right? And the ability for providers to figure out. Uh, which plan is going to be right for the patient is incredibly difficult. And so I, I think the more that we can do to solve those problems over time and the more that we can take off of the provider is only going to help the patient. At the end of the day, they're going to trust their provider. They know their provider. Uh, I think South Florida is probably uh, way more advanced in that area in terms of the, the marketing aspects that happen than other parts of the country. But it's going to quickly evolve into a, a lot of other places like South Florida has done as well. Even without the design perspective from an insurance side of it, we, we do a lot with the patients directly. So from a care coordination perspective, uh, there's a lot that we do to help the patients around uh, scheduling, could be on gaps in care, could be on wellness appointments, it could also be on closing the gap. So if someone's eligible for a colonoscopy and not everyone would qualify for this, our team can send them a Cologuard kit. They can do that at home, they can do it remotely. It's way more convenient, improves their access to care, is gonna prevent you know, downstream costs associated with that. Uh, but there's also a lot that we do uh, and will continue to roll out around just overall social determinants, right? And so one of the things that we found purely using uh, discharge notifications from the hospital, uh, uh, you know, within that data, it gives you the chief complaint and it gives you the demographic information. From those two stats alone, we can predict whether sepsis is present upon admission for someone presenting up to the hospital with a 95% AUC or accuracy associated with those models. A lot of the high, you know, most predictive factors associated with those are purely zip code. So right. terms of health. And, and so as our nurses and care managers are on the phone with patients, we can flag which questions they should be asking. Food in the fridge is a really good example of that. Based on your zip code, the likelihood of having food in the fridge will, will vary drastically and help them solve those core uh, needs to get access or help them fulfill the benefits that already exist under their plan that they don't even know exist under their plan. Uh, and so there's a lot that we try and do to help them get access to those from our nursing team and our, our care coordination team. I'd like you all to think, because Amy, before we get to, about cost sharing, while, while maybe in Palm Beach, most of the plans have no premium and no cost sharing, I've worked with Greg Gearer for a decade you know, the idea that just one of the reasons why I heart MA is the out-of-pocket cost difference between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. Now, some, off, some offer a zero, zero, but some don't. And the fact that um, many Medicare beneficiaries still have significant out-of-pocket cost burdens to get the care they need, which is why one of the main part of the peanut butter and jelly things is the things we really want to encourage, uh, like say colorectal cancer screening, Kyle, uh, we're lucky that the ACA, at least for, for now, till the Supreme Court, other courts look at it, uh, people can get that colorectal cancer screening at no cost. That is still not the case for the drugs that Amy and I beg our patients to do or the specialty visits or diagnostic tests, which is why I, I really hope that one day uh, that we'll have a situation that it'll be easy for me to prescribe those things and no, it will not be hard for me to be reimbursed to tell my patient that they will have an easy time of it which is what I believe all your organizations do. So, Amy, please, if you. Sure. Um, so, I, I'll answer. I, um, I'll answer this a little differently uh, because the, the peanut butter and jam structure is very real to us in that uh, we want and are committed to creating a better model of care for our patients but also have to make it better for our providers because we are asking them to deliver care in the home. And I don't know how many in the audience have tried to do house call medicine, but it takes a very special person. And so we have a duty to our providers to facilitate the care 
and make sure that um, this is kind of a sustainable uh, and rewarding model for them. And so when I think about how to uh, make the peanut butter and jelly really gel, I would say we leverage a number of enablers as a company that create really good outcomes and a really good experience both for our patients and for our providers. One example of that is the way in the background that we use technology around patient stratification. So we've ingest as much data as we can get our hands on, apply our own proprietary risk algorithms as others have referenced, and have gotten pretty good at identifying which patients are likely to become higher risk, which patients are likely to find themselves in the hospital, and can then lever up and really increase the intensity of services for those patients. That's seamless. The patients are just getting an extra call and getting some extra TLC, and the providers are getting that extra support so that their patients are not hopping in and out of the hospital. Another example is we really like to use virtual care. And we find a lot of patients want to do video visits, but may not have the hardware at home, or if they do, may not have the literacy and comfort to set up those visits. And so we will leverage what we call assisted telehealth, where we send people into the homes of our patients, they'll set up the technology, they'll, they'll hold the iPad if that's what it takes. Uh, and so we use a lot of these enablers in the background in the form of care coordination, risk stratification, assisted telehealth, uh, and other things that um, if we had more time I could get into, but things that uh, create a seamless experience for providers and for patients. I think much of the time folks don't know these things are happening in the background and that's just how we would want it. Uh, we just know that our patients have access to providers 24 hours a day and our providers get to do house call medicine with a lot of support, uh, multidisciplinary team and the backing of technology. And your patients pay, face limited or no out-of-pocket burden for this? Has that been worked out? Yes, none. Good answer. David, please. Thanks, Mark. So maybe I'll, I'll answer the question um, with a very specific peanut butter and jelly sandwich in mind. And it's an example of where the rubber hits the road um, in terms of uh, well-intentioned policy change and actual implementation and the challenges associated with that. So um, I guess this is on the jelly side. Uh, one of the biggest barriers to accessing hospice today is that for many individuals, uh, they have to cross a chasm, right? They have to make a decision to no longer pursue curative care. And that, for many, is a very binary black and white decision and a very difficult one and often delays transition to hospice when someone could have benefited from the hospice model sooner. So CMMI, with all the best intentions, has included the flexibility to provide what's called transitional concurrent care in, in, in their VBID hospice model which for the first time ever would allow someone who is enrolled in hospice to at the same time continue pursuing curative care, dialysis, a few more rounds of chemo, et cetera, for a limited amount of time as a way to encourage um, uh, individuals to make the decision to enter hospice sooner. Conceptually, it makes a lot of sense, right? We were very excited about this. The reality of actually testing this model, though, is that you are testing it in, in, a, in the context of a provider community that is used to a certain paradigm. For decades, right, the hospice, uh, entry to, into the hospice model has always required this black and white decision. And so what we're finding is that we, in, uh, we've, we've had very little use of this, of this flexibility, and what we're, what we're working on doing is educating not only our own members, but providers much further upstream around this um, as an option and how this could benefit them. But I think it's a good example of where you have a, you know, you have the peanut butter that's, that, that's payment or policy reform that's well-intentioned, and it's meant to address a real patient-centered uh, barrier, but implementation, I think, is, uh, is the devil's in the details and it's easier said than done. Right, so you set me up perfectly, so I'll start with you. So I sit here inspired, right, and think, oh, next time, well, Mary Beth may not invite me back, but if I get invited back, we're going to say, oh, all the problems are, are answered, which they, so what, we, I think she used the term Mary Beth, or Liz talked about friction. So there, there's friction that we're all talking about just at the micro level, uh, but feel free to talk about the friction about these great ideas, right, that uh, preventing them from moving forward. 
I will say, looking at your slides, as a health services researcher, Amy, that um, many organizations for many, many decades have come to me to tell me that their implementation actually saves lives and saves dollars. It's important for you to hear, at least from me, that setting a bar at cost neutrality is a false one in just about everything we beg our patients to do, young and old, are cost effective and not cost saving, meaning uh, we spend money to achieve an outcome that we all want to see, which is people living a longer and better life. And to set the bar at uh, save lives, save dollars has been extraordinarily hard. You know the evaluation of the hotspotters and other types of things, and I don't even think that we need to go there. The great healthcare policymaker Woody Allen uh, once said, the best way to reduce expenditures is death. That was true then, that is true now. I am not in that business, but if people do have to die, which I believe they do, I've been a proponent of hospice, as you know, for a very long time, and it's one of the few things that actually the empirical evidence is quite strong on, uh, in fact, making lives better and lowering costs compared to traditional care. So uh, I'm inspired. Uh, tell me about how you're dealing, you all, with your individual organizations or personally with trying to lubricate uh, this unwieldy system to uh, reduce the friction at least a little bit. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer again from, yeah, the, please. from yeah. the, I think, perspective of, um, of, of improving access to hospice, which is um, that the, there is a natural friction that exists between managed care organizations, Medicare Advantage plans, and, and providers, in particular, what, we, what, the, what plans considered ancillary providers. I think that my co-panelists my co here are all um, you know, innovative, would, would be innovative and well-embraced members of any health plan network, right? But, but we all know there are many big bad ma managed care plans out there that, uh, that look at, uh, look at um, these, uh, these providers as, as cost to, to, to UM, right? To, to manage the utilization of. And so a potential friction of folding in hospice into the Medicare Advantage program is that plans will see that as an opportunity to ratchet down right. utilization, to, right. to cut rates, to, um, uh, rather than seeing it as an opportunity to you know, improve value across you know, the entire uh, you know, uh, uh, population. And so I think, you know, as I mentioned before, the way we're approach approaching it is to take a very, as a health plan, a very provider-friendly approach that's very familiar to us because we are a provider ourselves, but I do anticipate that this, there will be a, a, a friction that policymakers will need to uh, put guardrails against um, uh, if, if, you know, when, if and when hospice is folded into Medicare Advantage because the, um, the, 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 um, the impulse to, uh, to reduce MedEx by cutting the number of hospice days I think will be more common than you would think, even though um, it's actually the opposite that we would want. Great point. Uh, I, um, you know, when I think about areas of friction for our business as we exist as this innovative organization like my panelists, in a world of healthcare that is evolving but not, not quite there yet, um, I think of a couple points of friction. Uh, the first is around data. I mentioned that data is core to what we do, and the flip side is that data is core to what we do. And so uh, when we have barriers to getting data on our patients, um, whether it's, as was mentioned earlier, uh, race and ethnicity and language data, whether that's claims data on specific groups, it becomes very hard to take the best care we possibly can of patients and to guard uh, their health and guard against inequities without really good comprehensive access to data. So I would say that's an ongoing uh, source of friction. I think we continue to get better and better at it, but that I don't see that going away anytime soon. Uh, and a second source of friction, um, similar to what you mentioned, is making sure that we have ways to identify and find and build connections with the right specialists in all of the markets in which we work. You know, we really want to find specialists that provide patient-centered care, that avoid low-value care, that are communicative, that think about goals of care, you know, kind of kindred spirits. And so the relationship building, uh, the tools that are on the market to help us do that are very important to us, but I think that that remains a complex process. Yeah, I think uh, 
I would echo the, the data point as well. I think on the data side, it's actually an area where Medicare does a better job than traditional Medicare Advantage, where if you look at DCE or ACO reach, uh, you get three plus years of, of uh, claims history associated with the patients that you partner with. You know, getting that from a new Humana patient uh, is very difficult, or any MA, MA payer, and we have to oftentimes bang down doors to get access to that type of data. And so as we're taking fully capitated risk on these patients, there really has to be a way for us to get multiple years of, of historical data associated with patients so that we can properly predict the risk associated with them. Uh, you know, on, on the utilization side, I, I think that ties into really a broader uh, topic, which is around the, the consumerization of, of healthcare broadly. I think most people in the industry would likely say consumerization is probably good for healthcare overall. And I would say we, we certainly agree with that, but I think there are points to that, and I'm surrounded by clinicians, so I'd love to get your thoughts as well, but there's points to that where the patient may not always be right, right? And so as I think about patient satisfaction as a good example, patient sat is a, a two-thirds star waiting this year. Uh, the biggest correlators to that are things like patient wait times. That's an area that we can certainly have an impact on. But there's a variety of other areas as well where a satisfied patient doesn't necessarily mean a good clinical outcome at the right cost, right? So if I'm sick, uh, I might want to get 10 different um, uh, you know, doctors to give me an approval and get 10 different tests to assume it's accurate. I'm not a doctor. That's not necessarily clinically the right protocol that should happen. Uh, and you might be able to do that through a, a better utilization management uh, and get to the same clinical outcome. And so I, I think that is a conversation as an industry, especially on the MA side, where it impacts as biggest thing as star ratings, that we certainly have to be having, which is how much should patient satisfaction be impacting the reimbursement side of, of healthcare uh, is a topic that we're thinking about. And, and that's critical, certainly on the affiliate model. As we partner with physician practices, we can have a lot of impact on certain aspects of care. Wait time in a provider office is very, very hard for us to impact, and that's gonna be the highest uh, the highest correlator to patient satisfaction. So a really? few thoughts there. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think sort of what has been implied in a lot of these comments is the malalignment of incentives means that if you want to stop that runaway train, you need friction. So the other option is to actually align incentives. And so our organizations, I think, are very interested in, in VBID and, and want to say, I want you to do this kind of care and, and I care about what the health plan is designing and, and all of these things because we're aligned in controlling total cost of care under a capitated budget. If you're in fee-for-service, it's, it's a different story. Um, and and you, you have this at a lot of levels. You know, what you're just saying about the patient's interests, um, you know, a lot of times they're led to believe something's better for them, but who are they led to believe that by? The internet, their fee-for-service doctor, uh, a friend, and if they can have a trusted relationship with a primary care physician who says, this is what makes sense for you, it's, it's not gonna work perfectly every time, but they know that there's that alignment, and if, um, if, if that happens, then I think the policy makers need to worry a little bit less about friction. We, just to tell a quick story, when, when COVID was uh, just begun, just had sort of been called a pandemic and, and we were really worried about it. Our population is exactly who it was, um, you know, causing the most risk to. And if you guys remember when there's no toilet paper, no hand sanitizer and all that stuff out there, it feels like a distant memory, but um, we were like, whatever it, it takes for patients. And it's like, are we allowed to? Can we do this stuff? Is it in the benefit? What if it's not in the benefit? Can we do it anyway? The right incentives mean that we should just be able to do the right thing. And so uh, I, think, I think incentives ultimately underlie where you need friction and where you can work to, to get away from friction. The more we get people to value-based care and truly accountable total cost of care arrangements, I think people can allow more, more forced frictions to, to go away. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. I'm gonna come to you each for a one minute or less rapid fire round. We have a large number of, of allies here. And if you could tell them like one action item you would like them to focus on to make your lives better, which I believe will ultimately make <laughs> Medicare beneficiaries' lives better, which motivates me. But I do wanna give a quick example of this peanut butter and jelly thing since maybe some of you are getting hungry. So there are some examples where coverage is great and payment is poor 
uh, the diabetes prevention program, one example. Uh, low dose CT scanning for high risk patients for lung cancer, another where there is not only an MA, but there is no cost sharing and still uptake is amazingly low. But the side where I worry about it the most is the things that I'm being benchmarked on, say like an eye exam for a diabetic, which I've been studying for 30 years. It's been a quality metric since you were born. Uh, the coverage for a diabetic eye exam, unless it's specified in the plan design, is actually worse in 2022 than what I started studying in 1987 because of this word deductible, which you saw probably saw my blood pressure rise, Steve, when you raised <laughs> it. So we need to get thinking about, uh, I am ordering these things and my patients say, I have to have a bake sale to get that done. And that's really the goal of what we're try, trying to do. So um, ladies first this time, 30 second, this is your, I love, I didn't know, as Greg knows, uh, I didn't know the word ask was a noun, uh, was a verb, I mean. What is your noun? What is your ask of these folks to make your lives and your beneficiaries, and we have one minute, so you have 20 seconds, because my math is bad, we'll go to about two minutes, 20 seconds on your ask. Uh, yeah, like 10. All right, take your time. <laughs> I would say that um, social determinants of health are something that we think a lot about that affect our members very greatly. Uh, you know, we do our best to take good care of people and then see that they may not have any food in the fridge or that they're missing their appointments because they don't have transportation to get to the visits. So uh, my nudge to those, whether you're in a community-based organization or involved in an MA plan, is to just keep that in mind because uh, that's the reality that our patients are, are facing. Kyle, please. Yeah, I would say there's a lot. I mean, if I had to pick just one, uh, the, the timeliness of, of payments would be a big one for the Perfect. industry broadly. Uh, you know, surplus is at best quarterly, at worst 18 months later. Uh, for a rapidly scaling organization helping providers, it's very difficult to execute in that environment. Steven? Um, I would say flexibility for providers who are taking the risk. Right. Perfect. I'd love to expound, but with the timing, I'll leave it there. And I'll, I'll just end with, uh, to, you know, to allies out there, uh, don't be afraid to create a voice for, for yourself um, within uh, the, the Medicare Advantage space. I think there's uh, there's a lot of room for additional voices, and I think BMA has really fostered that um, in driving policy that impacts MA. Stephen Green, Kyle Wales, Dr. Amy Flaster, David Rosales, thank you all very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.